Okay, good morning, everybody. When does life begin? What I mean by life is not cellular division, not a beating heart, not the capacity for repair. Not that those things don't matter, they do matter. They matter hugely. I vividly remember my partner, eight weeks pregnant with our first daughter, and our paediatrician asked with a sly grin, would you like us to find the heartbeat? Would you like me to find it for you? Damn right we would like that, we said. And so he found it. And I still remember the excitement of that whoosh, whoosh, boom, boom sound that filled the room. That sound meant something. It mattered. But it didn't matter to Hannah, our then unborn, unnamed, and as it happens, unsexed daughter. She was far from the life that any of us would recognize. She was not yet active, feeling, sensing, thinking, purposive, valuing, social, relating, caring, choosing, all those kinds of things. I've spent a lot of my career trying to work out when the various things in that list switch on. Movement, as an example, is fairly easy. Movement you can observe directly and objectively using an ultrasound from about six to eight weeks. But movement isn't what we mean by active. When you're active, you're trying to do something. You're trying to get somewhere. You have a purpose. It's quite a reach, no pun intended, to suggest that the fetus is trying to do something or get somewhere. What would it be trying to do? Where would it be trying to go? If the fetus is trying to do something, then it must have thoughts directing its effort. The fetus is cause pushed. It's not reason pulled. Fetal actions are reflex actions, getting the organism ready for the tasks to come, like suckling, orienting, and flailing. Those fetal motor programs go off without option. The activity they beget happens without chosen variations. So maybe the fetus can't consciously choose an action. Perhaps, though, they have the neural sophistication to consciously sense the world around them, to be aware of the stimuli in their environment. Clever experiments have demonstrated that visual and auditory stimuli can cause a brain reaction in the fetus from around 16 weeks gestation. So it's argued that the fetus can see and hear at least from a little before halfway through pregnancy. Except it depends what you mean by see and hear. If you look over to where I was sitting a moment ago, um, you'll identify there's a Rubik's cube sat um, on the couch there. And the fact that the cube is separate from the glass and separate from the notes that are sitting on the chair and separate from the chair, surely those kinds of features would come to you automatically. Well, that's what neuroscientists thought until about 30 years ago when it became possible for cataracts to be surgically removed and replaced with plastic lenses to restore sight. People who were unfortunate enough to be born with cataracts or lived their entire lives blinded by them now had the opportunity to have an operation and have their sight restored. It was broadly believed that once the operation restored sight, um, the patients would be able to move about the world and act upon it in the same way that you and I do, that they too would be able to identify the cubiness, the glassiness, the notes, the seat, and so forth. But that turned out to be wrong. When patients with their sight restored were shown a cube like that one there, and they were massively confused. They identified up to nine different objects being presented to them. The truth is that objects are ambiguous. Deciding what features do and don't belong together is not automatically delivered by eyes and brains, but it takes some time to understand and develop. You can get a taste of what the patients went through um, by looking at the Necker cube on the board over there. The Necker cube is a line drawing of a three-dimensional cube. And at first sight, obviously, it's just a cube. But which corner pops out? Sometimes when you look here at the white corner, that will pop, at, pop out at you. And sometimes when you look here at the yellow corner, that will pop out at you. So which is it? Is it the right way with this corner popping out or the right way with that corner popping out? Or is it even a three-dimensional cube at all? Isn't it just a series of lines on a blackboard? What the fetus experiences is not that. It might be something on the road towards that, and that's not so far from where I began. The fetus is alive, but not living a life as we know it. Finding a moral obligation based on a beating heart or a feature detector is not easy. 
The fetus most definitely does not have the neural structures necessary for binocular depth perception, for example. Those cells are going to develop in response to visual experience coordinated between the two eyes after the fetus is born. But you would surely think me more than a little odd if I suggested that the fetus could be terminated because it lacks the capacity for binocular depth perception. And similarly, you might find it quite peculiar to argue that we should not terminate the fetus because it can detect its salty environment. Why would we want to make a moral virtue out of tasting salt? Defending the fetus in and of itself because of what it inherently is, technically alive but not yet living a life, is difficult. The fetus is meaningful to us and for us, but not to itself and for itself. The potential parents, the fetus is highly meaningful, and we can defend the fetus because of what it is for the putative parents. Their desire for a child, their hopes and dreams embedded in the pregnancy, provide us with a potent moral basis to protect the fetus and nurture the pregnancy to term and birth. The fetus is also important and meaningful because of what it is for all of us. Our desire for a new generation to carry forward our human projects, to bring to fruition the promise of a better world after we have all gone. That also provides a potent moral basis to protect the fetus, nurture the pregnancy to term and birth. But those moral demands rest not on what the fetus is, but on what it abstractly promises. And if the woman carrying the fetus does not want to be pregnant, her concrete desire to control the life she is living will surpass the reality of the fetus that is technically alive, but not yet living a life. Thank you.